Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Audit Committee for August 17th, 2022. I'm Lene Palmasano and I'm the chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum. Committee member Payne. Present. Koski. Present. Fisher is absent. Singleton. Present. Abeni. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. There are five members present. Thank you. Um, let the record re reflect that we have a quorum. We knew that Mr. Fisher would not be able to make it, and he's been so diligent about um, every meeting, and he's provided his thoughts for us today at this meeting as well. So I wish him well. Um, he had another commitment that he could not get out of. Colleagues, our agenda is before us. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That carries and the agenda is adopted. Next, we have the acceptance of the minutes from our last regular meeting of June 27th, 2022. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That carries and the minutes are accepted. Next, we move on to new business. We have a staff presentation of the city auditor position and the audit ordinance. I will invite Director Casey Carl to help walk us through those documents. Welcome, Mr. Carl. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and to members of the Audit Committee. As indicated, my name is Casey Carl. The privilege of serving as the clerk of the City of Minneapolis, and I'm here today to report back on prior directives this body issued at its February 7th meeting. At that time, the committee directed the clerk, in cooperation with our internal auditor, to research and report back recommendations on the structure of the audit committee as it is reconstituted under our new government structure, which was adopted by voters last year, and in consultation with the Human Resources Department to undertake an evaluation of the new city auditor position mandated under Charter Amendment Number 184, the Government Structure Amendment. Uh, before I get started, I should say, hopefully you have a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, and there are some additional copies, I think, with the clerk available for anyone in the public. Uh, I'll continue. This body knows at last year's general election, Minneapolis voters approved a change in the city's form of government, which established an executive mayor and legislative council structure, which is based on the traditional strong mayor system of municipal government. That new form of government became effective on December 3rd last year. As shown on this slide, this new structure focuses on a separation of powers between an elected chief executive, the mayor, and a legislative body called the city council. This is a system of shared powers that incorporates a system of checks and balances between the legislative branch and the executive branch, loosely comparable to what is in place at federal and state levels of government. In the new government structure, the mayor is the policy leader of the city and functions as its chief executive officer. The mayor leads the city's administration, which encompasses its operating departments, and is responsible for the implementation, administration, and enforcement of laws, policies, and regulations. The mayor also serves as the city's official spokesperson. By contrast, and complementing those executive functions, the city council, as the city's chief policy-making body, is composed of 13 legislators, each elected from a separate ward of approximately 33,000 residents. In addition to their legislative and policy-making functions, council members exercise oversight of the city administration and evaluate its performance against established city goals and priorities, and each council member provides representation and service to their constituents. Over the past eight months, staff have been working to support the implementation of a new government structure and the realignment of operating departments that constitute the city's administration under the mayor's authority. <clears throat> so on this slide, what you'll see is the proposed organizational structure Mayor Fry has presented to the city council. The city council and the mayor together must provide for the ultimate administrative structure and operation of the city government, and we are working to bring that new structure forward as part of an omnibus government structure ordinance that we anticipate will be up for final consideration in late October or early November this year. And as you can see on this chart, uh, the proposed table of organization does reflect the new city auditor position as a part of the legislative branch under the general oversight of the city council. In response to the committee's prior directives, I'll be focusing my comments today on staff's recommendations for how that reconstituted audit committee might be established as part of the government structure ordinance and how the job description for the new city auditor position might be developed. 
In your briefing materials, staff have provided a high-level summary of the job description for the city auditor, which reflects the duties, along with a report from our external consultant, Gallagher, who was hired to evaluate that position, as well as a high-level summary of recommendations uh, related to the reconstitution of the audit committee in line with the requirements of Charter Amendment Number 184. With your permission, Madam Chair, I'd like to start by reviewing the city auditor position, and then I'll move to recommendations on the audit committee. So as I indicated earlier, the city auditor is a new executive level position. It was created under the auspices of the government structure charter amendment. And as shown on this slide, the position is envisioned as having two very broad functions. First, the auditor is an independent officer of the municipal government and is responsible for providing objective assurance and consulting services to evaluate and improve the overall effectiveness of the city's operations. This work includes performing risk-based audits and investigations, as well as consulting services across the municipal enterprise, monitoring and assuring compliance with applicable laws, policies, and regulations, and minimizing strategic, financial, reputational, and operational risks. These are largely the functions that you all are familiar with today that are performed by the city's existing internal audit function. Those continue into the future, likely could be enhanced under the new Office of City Attorney, oh, I'm sorry, City Auditor. Second, the Office of City Auditor is planned to serve as the professional arm of the City Council and of its committees by supporting its legitimate legislative policymaking and oversight functions. And to achieve this vision, staff has recommended that the Office of City Auditor be composed of three divisions, all of which would be under the direct supervision and control of the City Auditor. So the first division is the Audit and Assurance Division. This division essentially carries forward that core, that core work of the internal audit function, audit and assurance performed by our internal audit today. Its primary focus would be on providing that risk-based and objective audit and consulting services, also investigations of any allegations of fraud or waste or abuse, and for reporting its findings to the audit committee. As proposed, this division would operate under an internal audit director who would be appointed by the city auditor and confirmed by a formal vote of this body. This double level of appointment is intended to help assure a clear separation between the audit division and other divisions in the Office of City Auditor, and it also reinforces a very clear and bright line of accountability from this body, the Independent Audit Committee, to the Audit and Assurance Division, as provided in City Charter. The second division is the Legislative and Fiscal Analysis Division. This new division would be the professional arm of City Council. It would provide strategic policy advice and guidance and would conduct a variety of research, analytical, and related functions in support of the Council's legislative policymaking and oversight functions. The financial analysts in this division would provide a comprehensive analysis of the mayor's recommended budget each year and would assist council members in their budget deliberations and also help to monitor and report on financial operations throughout the year and provide uh, some help on financial policies adopted by the council. The policy analysts in this division would be assigned to the committees so that they could help develop subject matter expertise and provide support for those committees as they uh, continue e evaluating proposals for local legislation and enterprise policies. They would provide that support for policy level work by planning, analysis, reporting, and ongoing monitoring work across the enterprise. Furthermore, when directed by council, these analysts would then be able to provide some objective reports and comparable research studies on proposals that are docketed for the council's consideration. Finally, the third division under the auditor's office is the performance evaluation division. This new division would be responsible for planning, developing, and administering an enterprise-wide performance management program to identify key performance indicators and metrics, to gather responsive data, and to evaluate enterprise performance against the established goals, policies, and priorities articulated by the city council. This division would also support the council in its review and approval of departmental business plans and the creation of associated committee business plans and support a culture of continuous improvement driven by data. 
So in this chart, I've attempted to illustrate the city auditor and the office of city auditor as I've just described it. It includes the three major divisions and the high-level reporting structure between city council and the independent audit committee. As you can see, the city council has a direct line to the audit committee, which it creates by ordinance. The audit committee then has a direct line to the city auditor, who is appointed by and reports to the audit committee. The audit committee maintains a connection to that assurance and compliance division as I've reflected with that dashed line. And then the city council has an indirect tie-in to the city auditor, also reflected with the dashed line, for the purposes of receiving support for its policymaking and oversight functions that are also reflected on those two new divisions within the office of city auditor. Next, I'll turn uh, my conversation to the recommendations associated with the audit committee. As this body knows, the government structure amendment requires that the city council create an independent audit committee. That audit committee is responsible for appointing and overseeing the work of the city auditor and, through the auditor, the work of the office of city auditor. As indicated, the audit committee would also maintain a direct connection to that audit and assurance division within the office for direct accountability for the core functions of audit, compliance, and assurance services. The audit committee would also be responsible for approving the audit charter, which would define the purpose, authority, and importantly, the independence of the Office of City Auditor and for approving the annual audit work plan, as well as any changes approved to that work plan. These functions are provided by the audit committee today. The major difference in scope of authority and duties is that today the audit committee is created in the code of ordinances, what we might call the municipal statutes of the city. The charter amendment elevates the audit committee into the city charter, our city's constitution. So it gives greater stability and a sense of permanence uh, at that higher level of authority to both the audit committee and its work, and by extension to the work of the office of city auditor. It helps to further insulate the audit committee and by extension the city auditor from any political influence or attempts to undermine the independence of both the committee and its auditor. As part of that charter amendment, however, the membership of the audit committee is slightly different from what exists today under the city code. Today, the audit committee has six members. Three are council members. One is a park commissioner representing the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board of Commissioners, and two are community members who have requisite subject matter expertise and relevant professional experience that are uh, outlined in our code. The Charter Amendment states that the majority of the Audit Committee's members cannot be current or former council members. Thus, a change in membership is required to comply with the Charter. On this slide, I've provided a side-by-side -side comparison of the current membership I just detailed, which is shown on the left, with the staff recommendation for the proposed membership shown on the right. So as you can see, staff is proposing to increase the committee's membership from six to seven. This secures an odd-numbered body, which is good to minimize chances for a tie vote on business before the body. We are also recommending that the membership uh, be adjusted to provide for a majority of its members to be individuals with qualified expertise and subject matter professional experience to help inform the work of the independent audit committee. Given the heightened importance of the audit committee, we believe that increasing the professional representation of this body is critical to its immediate and long-term success. So we are proposing a mix of three elected officials, two council members, and one park commissioner to provide the political leadership reflecting values and priorities of the community, balanced with four community members who would be qualified with subject matter expertise and professional experiences, preferably in auditing, accounting, financial management, or a closely related field, and with a preference for work in the government sector. Those qualifications are reflective in the code of ordinances today for the two community members. So that change would reduce one seat currently held by a council member and would add two new seats for community representatives who would be appointed by the city council using the city's open appointments policy and procedures. On this slide, I've attempted to reflect all of those changes. So you can see that the two major appointing authorities are the city council and the park and recreation board. The city council president, as current, would designate, subject to confirmation by the full council, the two council members to be assigned to the audit committee and would also designate one of those members to be the committee chair. 
Again, that's the process in place today under the city code. The Park and Recreation Board would designate its representative commission member. These three elected officials would provide the political representation to connect with the values and priorities of their various constituencies and the communities that constitute the city of Minneapolis. The city council would be responsible for appointing the four community representatives, and these individuals would then be selected through the city's open appointment process set forth in section 14.180 of the city code. These four individuals, as I indicated, would need to demonstrate expertise and professional experience in relevant fields. The result uh, is that the majority of the audit committee would be individuals who have the skill set, professional background, and experience to speak the vernacular, as it were, of the city auditor and to bring to the committee the benefits of that professional expertise. Community members would be appointed to three-year terms with a limit of no more than two consecutive terms for a total of six years. That is what's in the code today, so it remains unchanged. As indicated, the audit committee is the appointing authority of the city auditor, who in turn is responsible for the services and functions that are assigned to the office of city auditor. In terms of next steps, staff would respectfully request that the audit committee take the following actions shown on this slide. First, we ask for your approval and concept of the job description for the city auditor as contained in the summary that was in your briefing materials. With that approval, we would then seek formal authorization from the City Council to create the new full-time equivalent position. The City Council has already sequestered contingency funds from this year's budget to create the position, and ongoing funding is planned in the Mayor's 2023 budget. We also ask that you direct staff to initiate a recruitment process for the City Auditor after the position is formally authorized by City Council. The details of that recruitment process can be finalized as we complete work to formally create the new position of city auditor. Finally, staff requests that the committee approve in concept the reconstituted audit committee and its membership as contained in that high level summary included in your briefing materials. And with that approval, we would then work with the city council to incorporate those details into the omnibus government structure ordinance being drafted right now. This slide prevent, presents a high-level timeline for all of these actions. As you can see, we would hope to finalize the formal creation of the new city auditor position in early September and to initiate the recruitment process very soon thereafter. It would be our goal to have an offer ready to extend to the selected candidate in October with a possible onboarding by mid-November, just prior to the Thanksgiving break or possibly on return from that holiday. Between October and December, we anticipate the council and mayor will finalize both the government structure ordinance and the 2023 budget, which will implement the city's new operating structure and its financing plan in time for next year. We would plan to transition to the new audit committee in the last few months of this year with the intention of swearing in the new audit committee in January 2023. That completes my presentation, Madam Chair. I'm happy to respond to questions the committee may have. Thank you. Um, first, we have questions or comments from Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Carl. Um, a, a few slides back, you had the side-by-side -side comparison of the committee membership makeup, and uh, one clarifying question I had is around council versus mayoral appointment. My understanding is this new makeup, these four community representatives would be exclusively appointed by council, um, but my understanding is that mayoral appointment happened for one of the two community representatives? Was that just by courtesy or was that by ordinance? That's a change. Go ahead, Mr. Carl. Through the, through the chair, uh, Council Member Payne, in the past when the audit committee had been constituted under the code of ordinances, it was agreed to be a shared uh, function. So the mayor had one appointee and the council had one appointee. Because the new charter amendment firmly puts the office of city auditor in the legislative branch, our proposal would remove uh, the mayor's appointment and put all four of the community represent representative seats under the appointment authority of the city council. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was something I was going to point out um, the mayor was a little bit surprised to see this in the draft ordinances and we've been starting to walk through these as a council um, the draft ordinances um, and and take feedback I want to point out that while the timeline is here on the second to last page um, this will take a while to get into place it took a while to find 
um, and recruit good uh, audit committee members that are going to bring the depth of experience and, and understanding. They typically come from city manager kinds of functions uh, or professional general counsel um, types of functions, and I don't want to undermine the fact that um, saying that we're going to appoint in January 2023, it might take longer for us to, to find people that are willing to serve in this capacity. Um, so I, I do hope that we're not seeing this as all of us are maybe changing positions because it's going to take a while. Um, the other piece is the audit committee ordinance itself is something that is done by city council. Nonetheless, um, we really do welcome your feedback on that ordinance as people that serve here on audit committee. I did get some feedback from um, Mr. Fisher, who can't be here today, um, who wanted to underscore, for example, that a really key part of what the audit committee does is to publish, right? Is to, is to yes, review things, but to make them public and provide that um, public tr trust in our city government by way of having this um, this arm and this function and the function of internal audit that you all do helps um, the public to trust our government and that's ultimately your function as from the public facing um, aspect. So um, I really appreciated his comments about that. On the job summary perspective, um, I want to point out this is a job summary, not like a written job description. So that's something that our HR department will do. Um, and, and the charter and the code will go along with a job description. So we don't need to kind of rewrite the code and the charter into a job description or a job summary here today. Um, but those things, there are a couple of key changes, as Council Member Payne just pointed out, that the mayoral appointments um, would cease to exist given this new charter structure, but we still have to effectuate that in in our code. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, you, you made me think of another, another question around these four uh, community members. I'm curious if we could maybe outline maybe a different, what, what might be the types of relevant experience or certifications that we would be looking for for those memberships? and and. I'm particularly interested in, um, you know, we, we've had some discussions, uh, at least within council, around this legislative support function. And as of today, that is slated for being a part of the uh, office of the auditor. And so I'm curious if that's going to be the case as we move forward in solidifying the new government structure. What's going to be the relevant experience on this committee that's going to both support the audit function and the legislative support function. What might be the kind of profile we would be looking for? I uh, apologize, council member. I was quickly trying to pull up the city code and don't have access to the internet. Uh, so I could show you in writing the qualifications that are spelled out for community members in the code today. It basically indicates, and I'm pulling from memory and I'm sure that the internal auditor can help me with this. It talks about experience in, um, uh, accounting, so a CPA background, uh, certified internal auditor, which I think is a CIA background, an interesting acronym, um, and then like certified government accounting and uh, auditing backgrounds, so or financial management, especially emphasizing experience in the public sector. I think that's why Chair Palmasano was saying um, some of our prior members have uh, been current or former uh, city managers and have that background, uh, financial expertise. I think obviously we could pull from the public sector the difficulty there is the public, the public sector and private sector are different um, and are, are uh, perhaps have different um, levels of focus on values versus bottom line performance and those things can be argued by, by others. I think the, the qualifications that would be necessary for an effective member of the audit committee are determined by this body itself. I think it starts with an understanding of what is the core function of this body. And if the core function of this body is that oversight element of the enterprise performance, certainly financial um, expertise or, or a real strong background in financial management is going to be key. Um, but I, I welcome, and you know, Member Fisher also had forwarded, and Chair Palmasone was good to send me his comments last night. I, I take his um, 
feedback seriously that there are more than just financial management backgrounds that would add value to this body. So I think ultimately it's for this body to decide what that is, and that can certainly be codified in those ordinances that we are uh, drafting. I don't know if I answered your specific question. Uh, I think the other half of that question is around the, I mean, the legislative support piece and whether or not having some legislative policy making expertise on, <clears throat> on this body would actually be beneficial? Certainly, I, I think, in, in my opinion, Madam Chair and Council Member uh, Payne, I, I do think that's something that could be helpful to this body as they exercise oversight of the auditor and through the auditor, the office of city auditor, which would include policy and fiscal analysts who would be directly uh, associated with uh, and aligned to helping council with its job. So absolutely. And I might offer that I think it's probably too soon to tell right, because we, if we have a legislative and financial analyst function or oversight function that lands in the auditor's department, I think we would want to delegate that full authority back to city council. Um, at least that's what I've heard from other people on council right now. So I'm not sure exactly, I think it's kind of too soon to tell. But broadly speaking, here's what I have. I, I think this is the most accurate one in front of me that um, four members of the Minneapolis community to be appointed by the council in accordance with the city's open appointments policy uh, and who would serve terms of three years with a limitation of no more than two terms. Uh, all community members appointed by the city council must have expertise, it says, in auditing, preferably public sector, internal or management auditing or financial management. Now that's fairly narrow and one of the things that we have specifically looked for and valued in the past um, are people with a demonstrated ability to maneuver through complex political situations um, effectively and, and experience, people who have experience in how organizations function. Um, specifically, one of the reasons why we were so interested in having committee member Singleton as part of our body was her uh, past experience and assistance with our police oversight functions and in diving into that. And that just is such a um, great asset of experience on our board since so much of our current work has been in working with um, or going in and to audit uh, our MPD, for example. So I think we, we take a look at the wide variety of, of needs that are part of our um, part of the work ahead for, and, and we get to see that kind of, you know, a couple years out. And um, I think that helps us to show, but we might want to broaden what we're saying that we're looking for in hopes to get good applicants um, as well. So I think that's really important feedback. Uh, Commissioner Benny. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one is related to the um, structure. Um, it's on page eight, uh, four, or maybe slide number eight, it says. Um, it's. I'm just curious about the dash line that comes from city council down to city auditor here and what, what the intention there is. Uh, through the chair, uh, Commissioner Abene, I will um, pull on my memory. I don't have my charter right in front of me. So the council by ordinance creates the audit committee. The audit committee appoints the auditor and it, the auditor is very um, uh, protected or insulated, I'll say, in the charter, the Charter Commission in drafting this amendment that was approved by voters was very deliberate. Mm -hmm. It spent a lot of time talking about how do you put in place someone who can be objective, a truth teller, mm -hmm. um, independent from political influences. Um, and I use the small p there, right? Political influences within the enterprise from outside community pressures. Uh, and so what they did is they said the auditor must be appointed to a four-year term and cannot be removed except for cause. Mm -hmm but the removal is the council's responsibility. So the council under the charter through a very prescribed removal process can remove the auditor only for cause once this body appoints that auditor. The, audit, um, the auditor, all positions in the office of city auditor have to be created through the council's process, uh, meaning the budget and HR and those types of things, they're funded by the council. And so for that reason, the council has a touch, I will call it a light touch upon the city auditor and 
by extension, the Office of City Auditor. Um, the auditor is within that legislative branch, as I showed at the beginning. So there is a connection, even if it is, I, I would say, at arm's length. Mm -hmm. This body has a direct contact with the auditor. The council has an indirect connection. Um, and I know there was some discussion about the legislative and policy analysis and oversight functions. Uh, and perhaps Mr. Uh, Patrick can speak to this uh, a bit. He has ideas on how these three, I deliberately tried in this chart to show a separation between them, uh, and, and I don't speak the auditor's language, but uh, thought processes that through the audit charter this body um, would adopt and enforce would have a way of referring to the city council and saying that the city auditor may take assignments from the council so that it still goes through the formal channel of coming to this body and then in the charter that authority is granted back to the city council. Did I capture that correctly? Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carl. I think the, the clear distinction to make here, and I think you see it on the slide, is the space between the assurance and consultation uh, function and the other two uh, boxes underneath here. The current audit process that you see in front of you each and every audit committee meeting still reports to the audit committee, still enjoys the same independence. That, that function ch does not change under the new structure. The addition of the new functions based on um, the, the standards that we follow, the professional standards outlined by the Institute of Internal Auditors would require us to have a bit of a firewall between the two branches. With that being said, there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration along the way as audits often lead to um, findings that may touch on policy that may be relevant to the city council. Evaluations oftentimes yield results that may indicate to audit that a risk exists or something isn't working well in an audit, working well in a department. So there's a natural information flow and kind of synergy between those boxes without taking away the independence and the current um, strict standards that we follow as auditors to do audit and assurance work. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I think that the boundaries that need to exist for this function to be successful are really important, and you use the term firewall. I think with the paradigm shift of this, the strong mayor system, I think as much of a firewall with the old practices is important for, with the council because it's just going to be a massive culture shift here. Um, and then my only other question or comment is, um, with the new structure, you know, I appreciate that the Park Board Commissioner still has a, a role. It's sort of over here. Do you see it, how it's over here all by itself? Okay. Um, so, you know, I think with adding staffing and things like that, for, particularly the legislative function, it won't, that won't really have any um, too much support work that happens for the Park Board. Um, I would anticipate, but I would hope that the Park Board still has the opportunity to um, impact some of the outcomes here, um, benefit from the great work of this body and things like that. And maybe there's a role, I don't know of, I don't, I don't know if that's possible, but some kind of role with the appointment of the citizen um, experts. And I also really do support the idea of subject matter expertise, so thank you. Madam Chair, if I could take a moment to respond to Commissioner Abney. I think um, as we restructure city government, this is a, a time of great opportunity for all of us to rethink how the government can function better, more effectively and more efficiently. And so I think that your role here uh, reflects from the beginning as we created this body and as we move forward um, a, the fact, and I'll be delicate as I say this, that the park district um, under a separately elected commission um, is still a department of the city government writ large. A unique department, absolutely, with its own governing body. But that governing body works in tandem with the other elected um, components of our city government machinery, the mayor, the council, uh, the BET, where the park board also has a seat. And so I think that to your uh, suggestion or point or, or maybe recommendation that the park board have a greater influence in both the selection process of community members um, and its ability to cooperate or or call on the expertise of the city auditor and the office of city auditor for work that is within the park 
board's jurisdiction is something that this body can work out uh, and can define through that audit charter um, and through your own bylaws and provisions. So I would suggest that the, I think that your suggestions and recommendations are valid and appropriate and now would be the time for this body that has the, I think the transition period that you were indicating earlier, Madam Chair, this body with its experience can help inform what the next audit committee, your successor, will consider and do. And that'll be between this body, the successor body, and the internal audit team to work out. Okay, thank you so much. Committee member Singleton. Thank you, Chair Palmazano. Um, could we go back to the previous slide again? This one? Uh, sorry, the one, the other organizational chart one with the dashed lines, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Carl. Um, so I had a couple other questions about the second dashed line from the audit committee down to the assurance and compliance um, audit functions. Mm -hmm. um, so just on a practical level, is there a vision for then how the audit committee interacts with the performance evaluation in the legislative and fiscal analysis? Um, so those oversight and policy making, making functions. Um, you know, I think especially thinking back to Vice Chair Fisher's um, comments about the importance of publishing the reports and the work of the internal um, auditor. I, I see that as being very important to have the work in those two um, oversight and policy making functions flow through the, the audit committee as well so that that information becomes public and it has an airing. Uh, Madam Chair, and to Member Singleton's comment, I don't have an answer to that. I think okay. that's on the table for this body and its successor body and the city auditor to work out through through its uh, audit charter, through consultations with the council, possibly even the, the Park Board of Commissioners in, mm -hmm. in terms of how all of these bodies will work together, draw on the expertise of the auditor and the auditor's office, um, and what role the audit committee wishes to play or what you are willing to delegate out. Um, and, and just as in any policy making body, the council or the park board, there's a level of discretion that uh, at this level we're comfortable delegating this work out and here we're not. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a decision making process that I think this body should give some attention to uh, and then uh, that can inform what the next body takes up. That makes sense, thank you. And then one follow-up question. Um, in previous presentations, we've heard about a public safety audit position mm -hmm. and then later positions. Um, do you know which of these buckets um, that public safety audit position would fall under? I will defer to the internal auditor who has uh, requested those positions. Thank you, committee member Singleton, Chair Palmasano. The public safety, community safety, that audit position uh, would kind of be on par with a senior auditor and fall in the assurance and compliance branch. I don't see it as this person's doing something completely unique. What they are is an auditor with a specific subject matter expertise in the public safety arena. So their work would function like other audit work and flow to the audit committee in the way that that does. So. Perfect, thank you. And then one final question um, on the um, city auditor job description. Um, I think, so when I was looking at the draft job description, I know it's just a draft, um, it, there were two sections of qualifications and one had um, an or in terms of like internal audit, uh, government audit, the CGI, mm -hmm. um, CIA, and then one had an and clause. And I just wanted to clarify that that would be uh, requiring just one of those certifications rather than all. Uh, Thank you, Member Singleton. I, if I'm reading the right section you're referring to. Is um, it in the overview? I think it's under the second page under qualifications, and it might be more of a grammatical construct where it says the auditor must be a licensed, you know, certified public accountant or certified auditor, comma, and must also have. Um, I think it's either of the certifications okay. and a demonstrated um, expertise in these different fields. Okay, that's what I what I thought. I just wanted to verify. Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know if it's best to separate it. If it does it absolutely need to be one sentence? Um, but it seems that is that is the intent. That's how I read it. But okay. Any other questions or comments from those on the dais? 
I'm not seeing any. Um, I'll move to direct the clerk to receive and file this report and refer to city council recommendations and our thoughts on the city auditor job description and the draft ordinance provisions regarding audit committee and also to authorize staff to proceed with the recruitment process for a city auditor upon establishment of the position by the city council. This is where this gets complicated and we've, we've reserved funds to do this, um, city council has, but we have not officially cre created the FTE. So that will happen next after the approval of this body. Um, and then what we're saying is don't wait for another audit committee meeting, go ahead and start the recruitment process. So. Um, any questions or comments on that? I'm not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That carries and that um, action is approved. Next, we have the report of our internal auditor. Um, Director Patrick will help us do the auditor update. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Thank you, Chair Palmisano, audit committee members. I'll be presenting the auditor update for today, and I'll note in advance, it's a brief one. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about the work in flight, and it's a very complex sequence of projects we have going on right now. Uh, you can expect results back in the coming months, but uh, as it stands right now, we don't generally discuss the findings or results of audits as they are in progress. So I'll just provide, uh, and my staff will provide a high level overview of those projects and what we're currently working on. Uh, first is the hiring and promotions process audit. Okay, um, this is, has to be one of the most complex audits we've engaged in as in uh, group of internal auditors here. Uh, generally, if you look at the objective, it's relatively succinct to examine the process and controls related to hiring and promotion to ensure they're operating efficiently and sufficiently to attract and retain staff. Succinct, what that belies is just how complex and how many moving parts there are in the hiring and promotions process. We're in the field work stage right now, so we're actually engaging in the testing of all the various uh, portions of this process we've identified. Uh, reviewing materials, doing walkthroughs with subject, uh, those actually doing the work, gathering additional information. I'm not gonna read everything on the scope. I think it's just important to see the scope and just, just how many items there are in this. So we're looking, of course, at position types. We're looking at governance, so policies and procedures, every policy and procedure related to hiring and promotions and the adequacy of uh, the department's oversight of enforcement of those policies, uh, the process and internal controls. So that's every step of the process, looking at each and every control to make sure that it's operating effectively, testing all of those. Alignment of data, analysis, and benchmarking. HR has goals. Uh, we have goals as a city. Do we have data that shows that our actions are in alignment with those goals? Uh, is the data accurate? Is it well-maintained? Um, is it secure? And benchmarking, so looking at other cities, perhaps conducting uh, nationwide surveys to see how other cities operate their hiring and promotions process to benchmark against ours. That is the, the hiring and promotions process overview. Again, massive project, but I think it'll yield a lot of uh, very beneficial results to the city. The next is the Department Managed Grants Audit, and I'm gonna ask Kamlin Alladay to come and provide an update as he is the lead auditor on this project. Welcome, Mr. Alladay. Thank you. Madam Chair, Audit Committee member. We, back in 2018, uh, internal audit conduct uh, the city grant process. So that we work with the grant office to review the procedure and proce uh, process. In, that was in phase one. In phase two, the goal was to review each department that managed grants at the city. So we, in 2019, we conducted a review of CPED grant management and followed by 2020 and PAC board, a grant administration process. In this one, in 2020, department grant managed audit, we included three departments and that was the health, police, and city coordinator office. 
Right now we are in a field work. The intended objective is to determine whether controls are adequate to ensure grant compliance and efficient city-wide grant management processes. So we, our goal is to come back in next audit committee to bring the final report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allade. I note that we're, we're selecting departments based on the amount of money in the grants received. So it's, it's kind of a ticking down the boxes of, of departments based on the actual grants that they're, they're holding and managing. Uh, final is the internal investigations process audit. So in this one, we're reviewing the city's process for receiving and investigating internal complaints to ensure the consistency and adequacy of investigations. Uh, again, like the hiring and promotions process, this has a lot of various components and steps throughout. And in this one, we're looking at governance, oversight and monitoring, training, data integrity and information security, and we're benchmarking against best practices. So we are in the field work stage. Testing is currently underway. Uh, we're conducting walkthroughs, discussions with the process owners and management, and reviewing documentation. So again, that, that one is very much in flight, and uh, we hope to have information back for you on that in the near future. Uh, we have an open invitation to the Office of Police Conduct Review related to their body-worn camera audit process. We know that that office appears to be undergoing some change in how they're doing, doing business and staffing. Um, so we'll make ourselves available to them when requested if they request audit assistance in doing that. This is kind of a back burner item um, to be available to them if they need subject matter expertise specifically in auditing. Actually, I have a question about that previous slide. Can you explain what you mean with the mandated body-worn camera audit process? Is that an audit? How is that different than what your department does and what the police department do? Thank you, Chair Palmasano. The, uh, Body-worn camera audit process that internal audit performs every one year for the park board, police, the next for the Minneapolis Police Department is a state law compliance audit. So we're looking at the various items that are required by the state to audit on a biennial basis. That's, that's how the, the work that we're doing to satisfy that state law requirement. Uh, the police department does its own monitoring of compliance with the body camera um, policies. And they have their own work group that does that. And in past years, they've presented back to the audit committee uh, based on a prior, more comprehensive audit that internal audit did. Uh, this arose from the initial Minnesota Department of Human Rights work with the Minneapolis Police Department and the city of Minneapolis. They had a series of initial findings uh, and recommendations for the city's actions obviously not the final negotiated agreement. This was, this was an initial um, look at what the city could be doing. One of those was a, a recommendation or a mandate that the, the independent office of police conduct review establish its own body-worn camera auditing process. So it's a different process in that it isn't looking necessarily at compliance strictly with the policy, but more of a broader look at what's occurring in body-worn camera videos. I know they're doing their own review and, and there's a lot of activity on their end related to this um, audits available to help, but um, I'm, not, I'm not the person to speak to exactly what they're doing now. Thank you. Can you just, is it, is it comprehensive or is it situational? Like is this, um, from what you remember of the MDHR suggesting this to OPCR, uh, was it as they review specific um, cases that they have a, a, a thorough process or a written down process that they would follow? Or is this about um, comprehensively all of the things that are ever seen on body camera footage by people who are you know, uh, certified to see that? Uh, Chair Palmasano, a little rusty on this because it's been a while since we've looked at it. The OPCR reviewed body-worn cameras for any complaint that they received. So that, that process was a complaint triggers a review to see whether the existence of body cameras, whether 
recording exists and, and tie that back to the investigation. I believe this was a broader look. So I think the term audit was used a bit loosely, but kind of had the same context of how internal audit works in the sense that uh, you're looking at a broader process and not just um, complaint originate. It doesn't, doesn't just exclusively uh, come from a complaint filing. Thank you. I guess my recollection is that it was more broadly about other things they might see on body-worn camera footage based on case review. Um, so I'll check in with those people to see what it is. It sounds like essentially audit is still here when requested, but you haven't really been pulled in to do any specific project or work with, with OPCR yet. Uh, Chair Palmasano, we do check in periodically, but they're they're in the process of, I think, building out their staffing structure and figuring out how uh, to support that function. And, and when that solidifies, particularly, I, I think, is impacted by the MDHR and DOJ analysis um, and how that shakes out, obviously, will have some impact on how they do their work. I can't I can't state that conclusively. I'm not a part of those discussions, but I imagine that that weighs into it in the same way that it weighs into our um, evaluation of currently conducting MPD-related audit work. Super. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll cover prior audit issue follow-up. There's nothing new to report in this realm. I believe in, in future months and future audit committee, we'll have report back on specifically how the police department's policy changes relate to off-duty overtime audit work. That They have made a number of changes. We've been working on other projects, and we'll, we'll have someone from MPD, ideally, come and report back on, on how those policy changes impact uh, the prior audit findings, uh, much in the way, same way that the FTO program, people were the best to report on how that, how that report turned out. I think they should come back and report back on how the new policy findings work, but we're in the process of validating it, tying it back to our, our prior audit work. Otherwise, um, issues remain unchanged for the time being. With that, uh, I'm happy to stand for any additional questions about this material or anything else uh, that the committee has. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Chair Palmasano. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues on this re review? I'm not seeing any. Um, so I will direct the clerk to receive and file this report. I do want to mention, um, because the state auditor is done with their work in our city, uh, they had the exit meeting has taken place. I believe Councilmember Koski was part of that exit meeting. Um, we are still in conversation with them. I will put it that way, um, playing phone tag with the state auditor's office about when they will come and present their findings to the public. Um, you know, that is one of the essential roles of hiring a firm in this case, and traditionally our work has been with the state, um, and they are our partners here. So. We'll look forward to that in the future, um, depending on when they might be able to come. They have mentioned some staff resourcing issues. Um, I think we will need to change our next scheduled audit meeting to potentially November 2nd, subject to committee member quorum here and perhaps our state auditor's availability. Um, but we'll figure that out and put that out as we get that set. Um, are there any other announcements from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any. I want to welcome Councilmember Shugtai for being here today. Thank you um, for being here and hearing firsthand all the work of our audit committee. I appreciate it. Um, that's what we've got. Seeing no further business and without objection, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>